We've been married, it's going to be 41 years coming this May. We have been married for 42 years. We have been married 53 years. 61 and a half years. Well, I can just say my first impression of Rob, because we both grew up in a little Baptist church, that's kind of where we met. And he was shy and very kind. And so I kind of liked, even though he was shy, there was something about him that seemed strong to me. So it really did attract me to him, but he was actually too shy to even talk to me. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Because um, what attracted me to her, of course, I was young. She was knocked down gorgeous. <laughs> oh, to me, in my mind, she was like unapproachable, you know. So I, what is she going to do? He even take a second look at, at this guy. We both went to school at Point Loma. Nazarene University down in San Diego. When I was eating lunch at the cafeteria, right across the street from the cafeteria was a big grassy area and we just we just kind of sat down there after lunch and soaked in the sunshine and all that. And this really cute girl walked by and she happened to be walking with one of my friends. And so I said, great opportunity to meet a new person. So we're chasing her down the um, what we called calf lane and we met then. That's the first, the first time I ever met her. We, we met when we were in junior high, and uh, I was very shy, she was very outgoing, and uh, she looked like she was fun and she was cute. We talked about this a lot, and we just don't have one time, because I think we laugh a lot. Um, and I think that's part of a good Absolutely. relationship. Is. Absolutely. During the stress times, Absolutely. humor is what's going to yep. save your bacon and, and the dialogue and the relationship because mm -hmm. it, it cuts through. Uh, it, it's an expression of love that you would take that, that attempt, that approach to be able to continue to deal with some of the struggles that we end up in your life challenges with, to be able to just keep humor as a basis. We probably laugh a lot, especially with our boys and, and their wives. So. Uh, and with friends, you know, we, we've we always been able to laugh at each other and at ourselves, especially keep that sense of humor and, and just find the funny things in life. I, I believe what the founding principle of our life is communication. And when you communicate with the other person and you really understand where they're coming from and know what's happening in their lives. We also like to spend a lot of time together. We have a lot of the same interests. Mark really enjoyed basketball, so I went to basketball when he was playing. And so I tried to, even though I'm not a super athlete, I've tried to find different things that we like to do together. And so we do a lot of sporting type of things and allows us to spend time together. We do that a lot. Mm -hmm. And we drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> praying together. I think praying individually for each other and for our families, but also coming together and, and praying, trying to find times to get away from everything else so that we mm -hmm. can just reconnect um, because we live very busy lives and also just intentionally growing in Christ separately and together. And that has been, I think, one of the biggest things in our marriage because God transforms us. And when we're transformed, it's better for our marriages in general. And so I think just pursuing Christ on our own and together has been really big in our, in our marriage. When we were expecting our second child, um, carried him uh, full term and he was stillborn. I remember a lady in our church who said to me, and she had walked the same thing years before, but she said, you have a choice. You can either become better or bitter. So we always tried to make that choice. We've been at it now for 40 plus years. You're gonna have some highs and you're gonna have some yeah. lows. But I think the one thing that really helped us sustain and some sometimes some really difficult, challenging things in life, we traveled it together. We didn't isolate from one another. We pulled together 
and we also sought out some some great mentors of ours throughout the years that would help us through some really difficult seasons. You know, one was I had a hand accident in our 30s. That was a really challenging season. We lost parents four days apart from each other. That's a tough season. And uh, so when you face those kind of challenges in life, those seasons, you know, we drew together and and just spent time with God and just seeking out some good influence. Uh, I think always keeping Jesus first. Um, and we've certainly gone through lots of highs and lows with 53 years. And I would say, I, I can't imagine going through it without Jesus first and Bill number two. I think you need to remember that as newly engaged or young married couples that it is imperative as a Christian to put him first above your mate, job, things like that. Jesus number one. My best piece of marriage advice is to laugh and spend time and have really good friends. When you have good friends, it strengthens your marriage. Don't take yourself too seriously, but take your marriage serious. Never say divorce. Never ever bring that up. Personally, I would say always make sure that your husband or wife is your best friend. It's really important. Not your girlfriends or your buddies, but your mate. And there's two words to kind of wrap it all up from a guy's standpoint. Yes, dear. That's it all. <laughs> Bill Johnson. Come on, Bill, right? Isn't that good right there? Yes, dear. Yes, dear. Yes, dear. There you go. Man, can we again express our appreciation to those couples in that video who... Uh, those are just incredible, incredible legacy uh, marriage couples at our church. And uh, I thought there was just profound wisdom there. And here's what I love about those couples is uh, Mark and Kim and Rob and Kim and Howard and Ruth and Bill and Marilyn. Those are couples that any of us can see uh, in the lobby, wherever we are, and we can connect with them. They will pray with us. I mean, they, they are amazing. And so uh, we're, we're thankful for them. So what we want to do right now is just we're going to have a conversation with uh, Troy and uh, Jana, as well as uh, Karen, myself. And uh, uh, like Kayla mentioned, if you want to text in some questions, it's going to come up on the screen right now. 844-980-2812. Good job, you guys, because I've got a freight train of questions uh, already, and they are super good. And we're going to try to... Should What's, we go back to your marriage of where we gave you marriage counseling 20 years ago? There, there we go. Yes. The 20, it was, it, they gave us our sex talk back 25 years ago. So there you go. There you go. We heard and, all about the uh, fast food and the gourmet. I think yes. Yeah, crock pot. We must have learned that from you guys 25 years yes. ago because we've used that we, for 25 years. Come on. I didn't know where it was from, but now I do. <laughs> now I do. So it's... Uh, it's all good. Well, before we dive into some of these questions, so talk to us, Troy and Jan, about, so g give us a, a two-minute, two-minute rundown on how did you meet and what were your first impressions of one another? So just g give us like a two-minute rundown. Jana, you, you lay your eyes on this yeah, hunk of hunk of burning stuff, love yeah, right she, there. <laughs> it, right, right there. And she almost missed out on that because Troy's <laughs> bouncing checks. Uh, yeah. Troy's bouncing checks. And he had a lot of B.O. in it. And, and he, oh. yeah. It's <laughs> and he, true. So oh. he's bouncing checks and he had B.O. <laughs> so there's hope. There's hope. There's hope. There's hope. I had horrible B.O. Did you really? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, he put his arm around me and I, I just about gagged. Oh. <laughs> just about. This close. Yeah, that's why we went out and bought a new suit. And then she paid, and I wrote her a check, and it bounced. No! Yeah, and she almost broke up with me. There you go, there you go. She okay, almost so, lost this. There you go. Okay, <laughs> so you, you met where and when? Yeah. First impressions. Like so uh, there's a program called Bible Quiz. You know Bible Quiz? Yes, yep, yep. And so I was a coach of Bible Quiz in Renton, and we killed everybody. Honestly, you didn't have pride at all. Huh? No, you didn't have no any pride. pride at all. Yes. So our team was quizzing against her team. This is how we met. And she buzzes in, green two, and she gets it right. 
And what you're allowed to do in Bible quiz is stand up and contest it. And so we were killing, did I mention we were killing your team already? Yeah, we were killing her team. And I stood up, Jeff, and I contested her response. And it was arrogant. It was like, all was like, this is why. Here's the three reasons she was wrong. And the judges gave it to her wrong. Ooh. So I say it's her first argument. The, and the only argument I've ever won was right there. Uh, <laughs> So afterwards, I go up to her, and I'm just like, hi. And she had, what was your impression? Yeah, my response to him was, get away from me. You have arrogance. I don't want to have anything to do with she it. She just. Like, no, thank you. Bye-bye. Next. She, she actually went, I don't, want, I don't want anything to do with youth pastors. She had a hard time with youth pastors. So she was all, like, negative. Well, they say they're all godly, you know, and then they, <laughs> they were jerks. No, yes. <laughs> just saying. So I'm like, no, thank you. I don't want to have anything to do with that. So. And, and so I'm from the city. She's from um, Kingston, Idaho, rural. So we had that going. So it was not good. So what happened is later on the day, her team was very good. They went to a final competition. Okay. And I just came in to watch. And as I was watching, I noticed that Green 2 was not a competitor, but she was a girl. And I thought, oh. So I looked at a college buddy. And I said, wow, look at her. And he looked at me, Roger Archer, and he said, you be careful, that's my sister. <laughs> and then, then for the next 20 questions, he said, oh, you two are perfect for each other. Because no. he knew me from college, yeah. obviously knew Jana. You two are what? I mean, so he kind of perfect. He said, you two are, were made, and made for each other. And so that was the beginning of a relationship. I went and, re and humbled myself and apologized and reintroduce myself <laughs> there we go nice 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 all right well let, let, let's talk about a few questions here so uh and i'm going to kind of weave in some of these things let, let's start with um you know everybody's here because they want to have a, a, a christian marriage have a jesus-centered marriage and so if we reflect upon a, a christ-centered christian marriage what do you guys think are some of the defining traits of a christian marriage I go back to the Bible, I'm sorry, <laughs> it's just what's in me, is um, taking scripture and applying it to my personal life, but then it affects our marriage. And I go back to love is patient. I mean, when was the last time you were impatient? Is that a word? Impatient. Yeah. Yes. With your spouse. Love is kind. Are you rude to your spouse? Yeah. Are you good. kind? Are you loving? Are you forgiving? Do you keep records of wrongs? And to me, a Christian marriage is, is you have to put Jesus, I like that in the video, you have to place Jesus first in your own life above everything else. And then it filters down because let me tell you, if this is good, you can then rest assured that this will be good. But this has to be good. Humble yourself before the Lord and the Bible says he will lift you up. And as you humble yourself before the Lord, then you take that same position to your spouse and you ask God to transform my mind by what? By the renewing of his word. Yes. His word is life. It brings life to death. Our tongue has the power of life and yeah. death. Yeah. So when you take the word of God and then you begin to apply it to your own life, it then impacts the rest of your marriage. It's good. Christian marriage... So what does it mean to be a Christian? What it means to be a Christian is that Jesus is the Lord of your life. Yeah. That's what it means, that Jesus is Lord and that you believe that God raised him from the dead. That's what it means to be saved. So what does it mean to be a Christian marriage? It means that Jesus is the Lord of this relationship. He is Lord in everything that we do. It means that I have to, I love what one of the couples said, you have to grow in your relationship with God individually and together. And so I just think at the end of the day, Jesus is the Lord of our relationship, and we submit to Bible principles. We submit to one another. The scripture is the guiding force, yeah. the gui guiding map of everything that we do. Yeah, I, I think that is so good. I, I would add a couple of things to that. I, I think what, what defines a Christian marriage, I, I think there's a commitment to stay in it. I think, you know, divorce is a cuss word. Yes. You know, the, 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 there's a commitment. And then again, like Troy and Janice said, uh, I think the Bible is at uh, the center of our marriage. And here's the cool thing is, is a Christian marriage, I mean, we've got the best marriage manual, manual that there is. Yeah. Right? But this 
talks to us about you know, how to be uh, the husband God wants us to be, how to be the wife God wants us to be, how to keep romance alive, yeah. right? How, 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 to, how to forgive, how to speak with one another, listen to one another. And so, man, the, the world wants to know the answer to the question of how do you fall in love and stay in love? And the Bible has those answers, right? And I also think this too is, is uh, there, there's a higher purpose, right, to our marriage, right? Where, where we are kind of in our marriage, it's kind of given the, the world a picture of the gospel. And so, man, uh, our marriage matters in such a significant way. And like, like you said, Jana, where you talk about like, like if this relationship is right, you know, Colossians three as, as dearly loved children, clothe yourself with compassion, humility, kindness, gentleness, and patience. Uh, I think it's so important that we remember that we are dearly loved in this sense before before Carrie loved me or I loved her, God loved each of us. Yeah. Right? So God has to be number one. Yeah. And, and then really, so the greatest gift we can give our spouse is a thriving relationship with Jesus. It's good. Yeah. 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 Um, all right. Here, here's you know, Jeff, you mentioned the word divorce. So when uh, Ruth Graham, Billy Graham's wife, yeah. someone asked her, have you ever considered divorce? She said, divorce, absolutely not. Murder, yes, but not divorce. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Answer. Uh, okay. Would, would you would you complete this uh, sentence right here? Fill in these blanks. A husband's role in marriage is, and a wife's role in marriage is. So, how would you guys complete those phrases? The a husband's husband? role in marriage is to set a godly temperature of the home. Is to love their wife as Christ loves the church. Think about that. How did Jesus love the church? He died for the church. He died. So my role is to be willing to die for my wife, to be willing to do everything I can. That is my role, to set the temperature of my family. A lot of people talk about, is the husband head of the home? Yes, just like Jesus is of the church, but he was willing to die for the church, right? Yeah, yeah. He's willing to give his life. And so that's my role, is to give my life. And I would say this, at the very end of the day, when it's all said and done, I hope to present Jenna back to the Lord uh, just better than she was when, I, when we got married. Does that make yeah. sense? Yep. I hope that, that we are better people, better Christians because of being married together. Yeah, yeah. What do you guys and think I, about? I would yeah. say a wife's, I was going to say, yeah, you're the head, but I'm the neck that turns the yeah, head. Yeah, that's true, too. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that's kind of true. Yeah. But I would say uh, as a wife's role is to love and respect your husband at all times. I've been in settings where women have their husbands for lunch in front of other people. And I just, wow, you'll never find me ever saying things about my husband um, behind his back. I have his back. I'm his greatest ally, so don't cross it. And that's the kind of, um, I think a wife should. I think we, we should honor one another and to love and respect um, your spouse. And I get it. Sometimes that's really challenging when there's difficulties and trust has been broken. What do you do then? Can trust be earned back when it's been broken, when the covenant's been broken? And I can speak to that and say, yes, the Lord can restore that brokenness. But the one need, the one need of a man is love and respect. I would say that. Good, 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 good. All right. Uh, let, let's get some questions here that you guys text in here. Uh, what are some tips to prepare for marriage? So let's say they're engaged and looking to prepare for marriage. Tips, Carrie. <laughs> there we go. There we go. <laughs> And so what uh, young couples are married. One of the things I say to um, engaged couples is this, is a uh, Find uh, people that have been married. First of all, find married couples that like marriage. <laughs> okay, honestly, find married couples. And the older they are, the better. Uh, don't hang around people that don't like marriage. And this is really big. And so find people that really like marriage. At, make sure they're at least 10 years older than you. Like, you also need friends that like marriage too. But I'm talking about older people and hang out with them. Hang out with it. One of the ways I became, when I say a great husband, a husband, a good husband, is I just found other good husbands that really have done it right, and I, I'll follow their examples. So I'd say get good married couples in your life. Very good, very good. So you guys mentioned this a little bit earlier with the seven years, you guys hit a bump. And um, 
we lis listened to the video and they talked about the highs and lows of marriage. So would you be able to share some highs and lows? I mean, we're, we're a group of people in this, this room. There are so many people walking through different things. Um, they know our story where we walked through infertility. That was, that was a low. It was hard. Um, there's other people that have, you know, lost a child, like what Ruth was sharing on the video. Um, people are struggling with health issues, whether that's physical or mental health issues. There's just all sorts of things that people are walking through here. So when you guys have gone through some, some lows, some valleys, um, how have you handled that as a married couple? Yes, seven years in, um, I didn't know who I was. And so um, I'm the typical people pleaser. If there's anyone in the room, you know what I'm talking about. In so much that I had a nervous breakdown. And here we are pastors. <laughs> pastors don't do that. And I found myself laying in bed. I couldn't get out of bed. I couldn't function. And the pressure, I mean, God bless him, the, pr the pressure, well, just get up, you'll be fine, just get up. And um, I couldn't do it, I couldn't get up. And so I found myself in a journey of like, I, I'm done, I'm done people pleasing, I'm done with the expectations that everybody has on me that I need to be this for all that. And part of it was myself. Um, and that impacted our marriage greatly because I just did everything. And I didn't want to have any excuses why I couldn't show up to something, why I couldn't use my kids as an excuse. And it was challenging, to say the least. So here we are seven years in. You know, my husband picked up a full 100-year-old house and moved it down the, the street two miles. We went into a church building project where we were going all of the time. And I had all these contractors, two small babies, no running water, no kitchen. And it... it it feels so small now, but to then I was just, I, was, I had shut down because I couldn't do anything. And so I had to go on a journey of figuring out how to be married and say my opinions without being rude, I guess. And so you went on a journey as well. Yeah, I, I, first of all, we should be shocked when we have low moments. So let me say that out loud. There's no way being married 35 years without having some low moments. And so I, I, one, one of the phrases I picked up over the years is I trust the story. I, I trust God even in the moments that are low, that are bad. I just trust God that he's trying to do something there. And so I just had to wake up as a husband and go, I really don't know how to be married. And it was a, it was a wake up call. It was call it whatever you want to call it. I decided that I'm not going to just, I'm not going to continue to uh, put pressure on my wife where I was putting pressure on her. And it, it, it's been a journey. It's been a journey because I'm a high energy guy. I don't know if you picked that up. Did anyone pick that up? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. High expectation, ministry, love it all. And still to this day, it's still to this day, we have to back up. And this is why we're so big into like getting away for vacation. We're about to go on a sabbatical. We're actually, by the way, we're going to rent an RV and go camping for two weeks. She loves it. I'm going, yay, yay. <laughs> and so I, I just think that for me, I had to just wake up and say, I want this to not just be okay. I want it to be phenomenal. And I had to lead that way. And it was, it was tough. It was tough because you don't, have, uh, there's not a lot of great marriages around. That's what's tough. I look around, most people are really dry, dead, or divorced, or whatever, right? Especially in my family. And so I really had to uh, go on a journey to say, as for me, in my house, I'm going to learn how to love her as Christ loves the church. So good. So good. Uh, there, there's a lot of questions here about yeah. sex and intimacy. So let's kind of have a, uh, a conversation about that. So uh, what are some suggestions for finding time to have sex with five kids in the home? All right. So, so you've, you've got like, you've wow. got, we, we, we've got five kids in the home. We've got three kids in the home. How do you kind of just keep? Sounds like they got that one figured out though. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You're doing good. See, Carrie's going to be so happy when we get home last tonight. Yeah. It's like, I made people laugh. <laughs> what 
got good. Woo! Five kids in the house. But so five kids. Lock and, and the door. Three. Lock the lock, door. Lock, lock the door. The door. <laughs> so, lock so, the so, yeah, so kids and life, and how, how do you just navigate that? Yeah. Yeah, I would say find time for that. Yeah. I think that um, you can, I mean, again, we used the locked door yeah. um, when we had small kids at home, and finding time for that is a challenge. We're not going to lie, but five kids is a lot, and so yeah. getting them on a schedule to where you can find some alone time, I mean, shoot, go do it in a car. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Just hopefully there's tinted Just windows. <laughs> it doesn't have I agree. I agree. <laughs> My car's in the parking lot. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. No, I, yeah, busy, life gets busy, especially with young kids. Can we just say that? Yeah. With young kids and jobs. And I think you just have to kind of, this is going to come for, again, 35 years. I have said we are doing date night. We, and part of that means sex. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it just does <laughs> and so I'm hoping tonight I mean I'm hoping <laughs> uh, and so I, I don't know how to say it you gotta make it a you have to make it um, a priority and it, priority's not even the right word it, it is it is core to marriage it's what Mary it's what God calls us to be do. And so now again I, to be just honest there's dry seasons there's time that doesn't happen. Can we just say that? Yes. There's times where we where we get where I, well, ah, you know, and you get frustrated. So all those exist. I it just you got to learn to talk about it. Hopefully before you need to talk about it. And with five kids, you just got to get really creative. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Real creative. We've had a few questions come in about how, how do you increase intimacy if like the roles are reversed? So let's say uh, the wife wants to be touched, the husband not as much. And so a few questions have talked about that. So how do you increase intimacy and recapture romance if the gender roles are reversed, the woman wants to be touched, and the man works more like a typical woman and isn't as physical? So, so maybe, maybe the wife wants sex more than the husband. And so for some people, they're navigating that and it's very real. And so any wisdom that you guys would give to, to those couples? I would say the principles are the same. Love and respect um, your partner's needs and desires. And so if um, the woman wants more sex, the man needs to be able to um, meet those needs just as the roles were reversed if a man needs, wants more sex. And if the man wants more conversation, then sit down and doggone it, have the conversation with him. It'll help you have more sex. <laughs> and just to let you know, honey, if that happens, I'll serve you well in that. I'll serve you well. <laughs> <laughs> no, it, it's such a hard conversation. The problem is, in this conversation, there's no one to talk to. Does that make sense? I mean, who do you talk to? Your in-laws? Oh, no, not really. Your pastor, not really. And this is a part of, and I don't have the full solution here, but honestly, it bothers me that we can't talk about this more. Yeah. <clears throat> and, I don't, and I don't know where the solutions are, guys, but we got to get to the place where we can talk about it and how to make sure at the end of the day, you, both of you have to be happy with the, the intimacy of your life. Both of you, and, and you can't, you got to just learn to talk about it. For us, we're just committed to talk about it. We're, we're just committed and no matter, and here's a conversation we, even when it's clumsy, we'll have this language. Can I have a clumsy conversation? Clumsy means it's going to be clumsy, and it's usually around sex or money. Um, yeah, I just have a big proponent of learning how to talk about it in a healthy way. We're actually going to go see a counselor, the two of us, for our sabbatical, just after 35 years of marriage to make sure we still love each other and life is good. Yes. So if you need to see a counselor, if you're going to talk about sex, make sure it's a good counselor. Yeah, I think there's probably some odd ones out there. I don't yes. know. But you got to make sure you see a Bible counselor. And make sure whoever you talk to that they are pro-sex in marriage. Like they really think it's good. Yeah. Yeah, they think that sex in marriage, Bible sex, is good. And there's a lot of people that have lots of weird things around sex that you have to be careful of. I would just add to that, you know, in our relationship, you are really more the verbal processor. Yes. 
Um, so, uh, so roles aren't like women are all this way and sure. men are all this way. And so I think that, again, it comes down to respecting one another and the question of discovering what they need and that quest to really understand them. And so the curiosity of, of um, your spouse yeah. goes both ways. It's not gender specific. It is love and respect and being curious about who they are. Very good. Very good. Another question that came in is, okay, so you mentioned you sent him to the doctor because you're like, what is wrong with him? And so... You need to be checked. How... Yeah. Like, different people here have experienced, you know, abuse or different things like that. And, and so they're maybe not able to just enjoy it in the same way. You know what I'm saying? And so, like, for example, for you... You, you got the news that he was totally fine and you're blessed. And so how did you like, <laughs> kind of, what did you do with that news? You know what I mean? Yeah. Okay. Can, can I add to that from another question? So, so there's someone asking about in this area, how do you redeem yourself after a betrayal yeah. uh, in marriage? And so let, let's say there's some trauma, difficulty, yeah. betrayal, how are you going to navigate that as a Christian married couple in this area? Yeah, I think that um, we need to be okay with not being okay and coming together as a married couple and saying, this really happened and this is very hard. And instead of turning against one another, turn towards each other and say, we can get through this together, but it is going to be a journey and once, once that line is crossed and something has happened, whether within the marriage or some kind of trauma has happened to you, be committed for the rest of your life to get whole and healthy. Don't live um, as a victim for the rest of your life. Um, address it. Take care of it. Go seek professional help. Get godly mentors in your life. Talk about it. Talk about it with your spouse. Don't hide, don't keep secrets. Don't have hidden things inside of there because that trauma will then come out in other ways and it will destroy the relationship. So I would say with those kinds of traumas, being, being brave enough to just address it with one another and have it in a safe, sometimes a third voice within your marriage is super helpful. We often talk about the third voice, whether that's a book you read together, a podcast you're listening together, or somebody that you respect in marriage to sit down and say, this is a really hard conversation, but we wanna, we wanna be healthy and be thriving in our marriage. We don't want it just to survive. We wanna throw gasoline on it. And so I think that being willing and humble enough to say if you're the offender in the relationship and you have crossed over and violated the marriage covenant, you need to go and first of all, bow your knee before Jesus Christ and ask him to heal whatever part of caused you to be that way and then turn to your spouse asking for forgiveness, but it's then, uh, now it's a new journey. It's a new path that has been paved in your relationship that God can meet you on that journey. There's nothing that we do that is too far gone for God not to heal. Amen. Nothing, nothing that we do that God can't come in and redeem if we let him. And yeah. it's about our humbleness of heart and our disposition to allow him into those spaces. And maybe you've been abused in the past and maybe that's a really difficult conversation to have. But if you never have the conversation, how can you get better? If you just continually hide it and, and stuff it, it's going to come out and it, it'll affect your physical life, your spiritual life, your emotional life. It'll affect your children, your future generations of children. So make the determination that it stops right here and right now and about face and allow God to heal you from the inside out. Very good, very good. Uh, Matt Ullman is proud of you for your joke, Carrie, by the way. He felt, uh, he felt very good about Jeff, that. Jeff, if I could just say, if there's been adultery in, in, in your marriage, there's, that's painful. And I, and I don't want, we don't want to minimize that in any kind of way. Uh, and if there's been abuse, th th these are painful moments. And I just hope that somehow in this conversation, um, we can give you hope for a better future. But it's painful. Um, 
the scripture that we can quote so, so quickly, but it's like what the enemies meant for evil, God can turn it for good. And so I just want, I think the church ought to be a place where we're a hospital for sinners, which all of us are sinners. So let's be a hospital. And that's you, I beg you to find help for the sake of your covenant and for the sake of your kids. I, I just, I, I just I, and I'm praying that for you. There's no words I can speak well enough to say, I just am praying that God would give you supernatural grace and supernatural wisdom. And um, in no way, if you're being abused by your spouse, should you, should you let that happen? You, we, we, you need to step in and find help. And I pray that God would bring that right help to you. So Very good, very good. Uh, can you speak on, is sex before marriage okay? You already know the answer. Really, honestly, when people ask me that, I go, you know the answer. You don't even have to be a Bible person to know the answer. Every study in the world would demonstrate it's not healthy. And the reason the question comes up, even people that are sexually active before they're married, you know deep down that that is not, uh, even if you're not a Christian for a moment, that that's not just good for you. That's not good for you. So, um, I will say this. This is why Paul said it's better to marry than to burn. You go, right? Yeah. That's supposed to be a little funny, but it didn't, it didn't, <laughs> it didn't quite work. Um, yeah, dating is, is tough, and especially in today's world, engagement is tough. Wow. I, I, I can't even imagine what to be single today. Like, we were obviously single, but we got married early, and we lived, we, we had a long distance relationship. Thank God for that. Because that helped us. We were able to meet each other, make out, and run. I mean, it was awesome. <laughs> and so, if you're single, I, I get it. My heart, my heart goes out to people that are engaged in all, all the uh, sexual stuff out there. Uh, but to answer the question, my response to that person is you know that that's not healthy. And by the way, I told someone this other day, one of my staff people that's dating a, a gal, I said, you are, you are dating someone, two things. She may be someone else's wife, so be careful. And she may be your wife one day, so be careful. Yeah. And so you're dating someone else's wife, don't, don't, be careful. And so it's a big conversation, Jeff, and I think we, obviously I hold the conservative view of yep. the Bible that yep. says don't do it, but I think we need to learn how to address it a little bit differently, just like, just don't do it. We need, people know it in their hearts. I, yes. I really believe they know it in their hearts. And um, that's why we need to talk about it in better ways. Good. How do you handle in-laws who don't have boundaries? <laughs> set them. We're gonna... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, really, it, it, go on. Yeah. No, I set them. My mom, um, yeah, wow, she didn't have any boundaries. And Jana's mom didn't have any boundaries. I love Jana's mom. I should be careful here. Well, no, yeah, I, I said that wrong. I said it totally wrong. Okay, you better take this over. Yeah, let me take it. <laughs> uh, yes, I would say become the expert in setting boundaries. And when you set a boundary, make sure that your spouse and you are on the same page. And we've always kind of set it out that if it's my family, I will be the one talking to my family. If it's his family... He'll talk to his family. Um, but sometimes when you've got messed up families, they don't understand um, boundaries and they're going to get mad because you didn't show up for that event because you just couldn't because for yeah. you set a boundary. Um, but you train people how to treat you. That's the bottom line. And so my girls, my family knows, and we all say when a boundary is set, I'm going to respect that. But that takes a person to be healthy mentally to be able to accept those boundaries. And so when they can't, you're kind. Again, we, we got to layer the Bible on it. I'm kind. I'm firm. And their response is not my responsibility. So if they get mad at me, that's not on me because I did not provoke them to anger. I just did what I needed to do to protect myself. Good. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, one thing I had to discover with a counselor, by the way, there's a difference between a boundary and a wall. Does that make sense? So you don't want to set a wall between where there's no relationship. That's really You good. want to set a boundary. And Jan has really helped me with that. I would tend to be all or nothing, either hey, everything or wall. And uh, you have to learn how to develop boundaries. Yeah. I, and a counselor had to help me see that. 
A good visual of that, if you don't know what that means, is a wall goes so far that you cannot see on the other side. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're stonewalling your in-laws, that's not healthy. Yeah. But a boundary, look at it like a fence that's eye level. And this is as comfortable as I'm comfortable letting you into this space. So I'm gonna build a boundary that's right here, but I'm not gonna build a wall where I never talk to you and I, and I punish you, where it's, it, you, we gotta be able to set those where we can have dialogue and leave room for people to change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, can you guys speak to the question here about how can you find common ground for intimacy in the sense of, as a woman, I don't want to be as sexual as often, that can cause some tension. How do I keep him happy? It seems like if we're not having sex, he's not happy. So wh wh where's that balance as a, a married couple if some are navigating that, that difficult kind of balancing act tension? Yeah, it's complicated, isn't it? Yeah. Can we just say that loud? Yeah. yeah. It, it's, it's emotional, it's complicated. And um, Jenna mentioned something here that's important. We often will find a third voice, sometimes a book that will help us, like a podcast, our mentors to talk about it. So depending how big of an issue it is, you may need to find really someone that's really, really wise that can help you talk about it. A third voice has helped us with our finances. It's helped us in so many situations. When we get stuck, um, who can we trust? Uh, and again, I'm going to say it's, it's too simple, but you need to talk about it. What is a good active intimacy in your life? Mm -hmm. You got, you got to kind of agree on it. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so yeah. <clears throat> however you agree on it, um, in, in every marriage, at least not every, no, that's not, not true. And at least in our marriage, I would tend to say more, she's less. That doesn't mean either one's right or wrong. We just have to find mutual harmony in that and, and just continue to have the conversation. Yeah. Very good. Well, what, let's go back to your, your conversation about who cares the most. Yeah. Uh, it was a question here about what is your strategy when you both have really strong feelings? Yeah. And so how, how do you navigate when it's not maybe quite that easy? It's like, okay, we both have strong feelings here. Well, what's your strategy there? Yeah. I was kind of thinking that I would probably have a disagreement about who cares the most. You yeah. know what I mean? Like, <laughs> you know, a new disagreement. To me, because we've lived like this for 35 years, it's most of the time obvious. But there's been a couple of times um, where it's not as obvious. And um, so, well, I remember one time in particular, it was, I didn't know who cared the most. It was well, a major decision in my life, in our lives. And I just said, okay, let's do this. Can you give me until, and I literally said, I need six months to process it by February 1. That's what I said. I need to think about it, and then we'll I'll decide, and, we'll, and, and she said, oh, I'll give you that. Does that make sense? And so that was the way we did it. We both so cared deeply, but we, we actually, I know that sounds way too organized, and I tend to be really structured like that, but sometimes we'll do that, we'll agree on, then when do we make the decision? Mm -hmm. um, we did this with the coming, having a third child, and should we have a boy? Um, that was the big one, because we have two girls, and... Um, I wanted a boy, I wanted a third, she didn't. So we just said, for 10 years we did this. We're not gonna, let's say, okay, we, we can't agree, cool. Let's talk about once a year, and we talked about once or twice a year for 10 years. And then finally, at the end of the 10 years, uh, at that moment, I realized she was really caring about this more than me, and so I submitted to her, and, um, and I celebrate that today. There, there's no angst in that at all. I submit it, but because of who cares. So sometimes you have to give it time. Okay. Did I do okay with that? That was really good. Yeah, good, yeah, yeah. I just think sometimes you gotta give it time. And I'm okay to say, we'll decide that later if we need to. Okay, how, how do you keep uh, intimacy fun during infertility? So let's say there, there, there's families here navigating infertility, deeply desire to have a child. And so you feel that, like Kara said, we, we walk that. But uh, how do you keep intimacy fun uh, and engaging during that season when you're kind of desperately desiring to, to get pregnant? Not pretending to fully understand that. Um, we've, we've journeyed that with many people who are very dear to us. So having the conversations of, okay, it's another month, another test. Mm. Um, 
more doctor visits, more pokes, more, more shots, more, um, and it's devastating and it's very challenging. Yeah. So in no way would I ever in a thousand years try to answer that question because I think it's a, such a sensitive conversation that I think, I, need, I think we need to have more conversations because I think people who are going through infertility feel isolated, they feel ashamed, they feel my body is supposed to be doing this, we're supposed, this is the way God wanted it, to be fruitful and multiply, the word of God says, and so we're not being able to do that. And they often feel like we're the only ones on the planet that are going through, and it's a very isolating, isolating. Mother's days are painful. Yeah. Father's days are painful for those walking in fertility. And so I think that um, to be able to see those people, we're walking with a, a couple right now, walking through that, and it's tearful. Every conversation, every doctor visit, every month, the highs and the lows, it's just this, con it's not steady. It's very high and low, and so if you're yeah. walking through that, again, I would say find trusted people who have walked that journey and cling on to them for dear life for any kind of hope um, because God will walk with you in your most desolate places where it feels like there's no hope. That's who God is. And so in no way would I ever try to answer that with a contrite black and white answer because it's just such a painful thing. Yeah, I remember when we were walking through that, we, we were, you know, going to a doctor, getting their wisdom, walking through that different process. And was it, we, we, we'd walk through the infertility, trying to get that help for a couple months. And then there was one month, right, where, where we didn't uh, kind of do the process, so to speak. And I do remember there was, in a sense, a freedom or a relaxation when we got a quote, quote, month off from you know, trying to get pregnant that month. And it was just, it was just kind of a, just a, a freedom and a rest. And I don't know if it's like, uh, cause it can be so emotional, so real every month. Do you remember that month being kind of a, uh, we just kind of exhaled a little bit. Yeah. Cause when we, when we journeyed that, uh, we, you know, you, you went to the doctor appointments and there were the shots and there were the, the exact dates that they like were I'm like, giving her shots. It was super fun. You, you never know how close you can get until Dude. you're getting a shot in your rear end <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> by your husband. <laughs> so, but you know, here's the thing. Um, God created sex for enjoyment, for procreation. And so what happens is that when you get caught into the, the cycle of each month, um, it can become more routine, more like planned out, uh, but try to make time in there to just enjoy each other, just enjoy the love that you have. And, um, and that, would, I, that would be just probably my encouragement is, and that's the other thing when we were going through it, we determined that we were gonna, uh, we were gonna go through it together. Yeah. We weren't gonna, like when we did the tests and stuff, it wasn't gonna be like my problem or his problem or whatever, it was us. And so that kept us on the same team and, and like, we were like, let's, let's just grow closer to God together through this and then let's grow closer together. Yes, yeah, so, and I would say you guys, you, you, you are not alone in this. Uh, obviously, you, as pastors, the, the, there are multiple families in our church that are walking through this right now. I mean, multiple, and I would even just mention, I, I know that Sadie's here somewhere, uh, but uh, the, 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 there, there's this awesome uh, brunch on uh, the day before Mother's Day, you know, for uh, this very thing, and so uh, get in touch with us, and we can tell you about that, because that might be a great, great ministry to be a part of. So, uh, okay. Uh, and Jeff, I, I do feel, just to say one thing around the subject of intimacy, because we talk about it pretty openly you should never do anything that makes your spouse feel uncomfortable in this conversation. Yeah. Period. And so as much as I like to laugh about it, talk about it's God's design, all that, all that, uh, you respect each other. So obviously, even just during normal pregnancy, there's times in after pregnancy where you can't have intimacy, right? Well, you can have intimacy, but maybe not sex. And there, there is a difference in those two words. Uh, but you never, like... You have to be in a total agreement on this conversation. I don't know how else to say it. It's I'm not going to do something or, or vice versa that would make the other person feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. God forbid, right? Yeah. 
Yeah. I, it's even like yet, the fact that you have to even say that today is is kind of it's kind of shameful. I, I I would totally respect her desire and boundaries and thoughts and as much as I think you need to add creativity and stuff like that. But you you don't go beyond you don't go beyond the comfort zone. Uh, you're there to honor each other's yep. bodies in the middle of sexual intimacy. Yes. Uh, if if a spouse is into pornography, what should they do? Get help. Yeah. Yes. I, I think that that is the number one destroyer of marriages. And it's at our fingertips, isn't it? Where before it used to be, before all the technology came out, it was the magazines or it was intentional of going and doing that. And now it's one scroll. I mean, it's just, it's infested into our culture. And so I think if um, your spouse or you are into pornography, I think um, number one is talk about it. Don't hide it. Um, The enemy loves it when we hide things because that's where stuff grows in the dark. And when you bring and shed light to it, it allows God to do his greatest work, but then it allows you then to go on the journey of getting healthy. There's classes, there's counseling out there for porn addiction. Um, And I would encourage you to seek that out and be aggressive about it because it's not something that's just going to go away. Um, We've been with, with couples who have navigated this and it goes away and they get it under control and then it comes back 10 years later because they're just tired and they, they let their guard down. It's like, you know, when they tell you alcoholics um, to not go into places because it triggers you to, to have a drink. Well, it's the same thing with pornography. You have to be on that for the rest of your life. Yes. And I would add this too. Satan wants you to struggle in isolation. Yeah. And I'll tell you that, that, that there, there's a w- wonderful guy in our church who, who would say that one of the keys to victory is when I brought it to the light, connected with the pastor, and so we could get him on a path. And so bring it to a light. Like Janice said, there's hope, there's help, there's yeah. healing, and uh, let's believe God for yeah, a Yeah, I think, day. Jeff, we just got to, I don't know what the answer is, but we got to talk about this more in church. Yeah. Right? Can yeah, we- yeah. Because it's so complicated. Yeah. You know, I, I, it's, it's like fire. Fire in the fireplace is awesome. I love my fireplace in the morning. I love the fire. But the fire that's in that fireplace is also going to burn down the house. Yeah. And we have to talk about it. We yeah. got to talk about it. You got to talk about it as a couple. We got to talk about it more because if not, we're just going to lose the entire generation. Okay, a few final questions here. Uh, we raised a large family. None of our kids would now call themselves Christians. Wow. It is so sensitive yeah. that we worry about talking about it uh, as it seems it will damage our relationship. And so uh, wonderful parents, kids, adults would not call themselves Christians. How, how do you talk about that? Do you talk about they don't want to damage the relationship? Tough. So the question is, the kids are not... So adult kids are not serving Jesus. We're concerned about talking about it because we want to damage the relationship. Any wisdom or what do we do in that situation? Yes, there is wisdom there. I think that we have to be okay with, number one, God created your children. You and your spouse were the avenue by which your child came into this world, but they belong to the Lord, whether they know it or not. They belong to him. They are his children. He created them. He formed them. He knows them by name. And we have to do our part in walking with them on the journey. And sometimes, because the conversation is so difficult to have, um, genuinely loving them, is the best gift you can give your child instead of shoving Jesus down their throat and making it awkward. You need to ask God, if you don't already have this, God, help me to love them the way you love them. Yeah, it's good. And I remember a season in our life where our girls were struggling with their faith and it was the most devastating thing as a pastor. This is tough. And I couldn't have the words to say embarrassed, you name it. I had it all. But the Lord gave me a vision one day, and I'm not a weird spiritual person, but he did give me this visual one day. And it was um, my, my arms like this. 
And when I would feel worried or I would feel stress and I'd want to fix it, I'd want to fix them. He says, give them to me. I made them. I know them. I know the journey they're on. And if you will dedicate them back to me and pray, don't underestimate the power of prayer for your children, by the way. Whether they're two or 22 or 52, never underestimate that last moments or along the way. And you need to be in tune so much with the Holy Spirit that when there is an open door and he provides that space for you to have that conversation, you're ready. You're armed and you're ready to have it at any given moment. But you need to have wisdom from the Lord to show restraint and not shove and not push and not prod, but genuinely love them the way that God loves them because he loves them way more than you do. Yes, amen. And so when you can surrender them back to the Lord, it allows you then to not worry and stress. And when you wanna take that, you just surrender it back to the Lord and say, you've got this, Lord. I'm gonna just surrender this to you and be ready to have it at any given moment when they're ready. Awesome. Uh, Okay, we got about five more minutes. This is the lightning round. All right, so lightning round. Quick, quick maybe 10, 15, 20 seconds. Here we go for a few last questions. How do you talk to your spouse about building healthy retirement savings? (laughs) Yeah. Okay. We'll just take two seconds on that. Just do it. Troy, in 10 seconds. (laughs) No, not really. Yeah. Not really. Not really. Uh, When it comes to money overall, you, you need, I believe you need to uh, tie 10% and you need to give yourself 10%, okay? And so I just think you need to establish principles of, you're talking about retirement and savings, right? Yes, yep. Yeah, you, you need to talk about money and you need to get some principles. You need to talk about it before you have to talk about it. So in our relationship, so you have to define this, she'll pay the bills, she takes care of the everyday bill paying and I take care to make sure of retirement and savings. It is very clear what we do. I'm done. There we go. Good. Uh, is it okay for a Christian to use contraceptives and birth control? Yes. Okay. Very good. Very good. Uh, uh, my husband uh, wants more kids and I don't want any more. What now? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Plan to have the conversation once a year and see if your minds change each year. Plan it out. Got you. Uh, What advice would you give to a married couple that's going through a hard time and they're trying to reconnect? Time, get around positive people, grace. Very good. Would you give Troy and Jana a massive applause uh, right now? Thank you so much.